houses. Okay, a um, couple of housekeeping things first. We we actually started this meeting in another room because we had some previous business, so we recessed this meeting. So first I need to, I'm gonna um, accept a motion to come out of recess. And so move. moved. The meeting. Is there a second? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And I'll all make right. a motion to seal the minutes for the non-public meeting. Thank you. Um, second. Positions for personnel uh, is off limits. That will be done in non-public session in accordance with New Hampshire law. Um, so what we will talk about publicly is, you know, possibly program level stuff or supplies, like things that don't involve people. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that um, that we're not trying to hide anything. But there are laws around how we discuss uh, personnel. Um, with that out of the way, I would like to first make a motion. Um, the board currently has a three-hour time limit on their meetings. I'd like to make a motion to go ahead and waive that for this evening. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And then lastly, um, I wanted to to uh, make a motion around public comment. So uh, our public comment section is usually 15 minutes. Um, we're required by law to have 30 minutes. We usually do 15 minutes at the beginning, 15 minutes at the end. Um, we will have another non-public session, so I'm thinking a lot of people won't stick around for that end one. So what I would like to do, if it's okay with the board, and I'll make a motion formally in a second, is I do see that we've got a fair number of students here. Um, I would like to give any students the opportunity to speak first and not count that towards our 15 minutes. And then after we're done with students, we'll open it up for 15 minutes. Um, and I would encourage anybody that does want to speak, try to keep your comments brief in case there are a number of people that want to speak. So I'm going to make a motion that we allow students to speak first and not count that toward our 15 minute limit and then proceed with 15 minutes after that. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so with that, I'll go ahead and open the mic um, for public comments. So if there's any students that would like to speak, come right over. <laughs> go ahead. And anybody that else, you can line up behind him or you can just wait till he's done and then pop up however you want to do it. Um, and when, for anybody that hasn't joined a meeting before, when you come up to the mic, um, state your name and um, where, uh, I guess, your street um, in town. All right, um, Campbell Nivison, 661 Cross Country Road, Pembroke. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Campbell Nivison. I'm a freshman here at Pembroke Academy. My intention in speaking here tonight is to provide the school board and community with some insight into students' opinions regarding the $3 million cut made to the proposed budget. First, though, I would like to thank the school board for providing me with the opportunity to speak here tonight, as well as for their continued work on behalf of Pembroke students. To begin my remarks, I would like to speak directly to the community in order to register the disappointment prevalent among students at Pembroke schools. Students do not get to vote on the proposed budget. We are expected to trust the adults in the room to make decisions with monumental impacts on our future. 305 of those adults failed us at that town meeting. They failed to support Pembroke students and they fail to support Pembroke School Board. My fellow students and I are angry, of course. We're disillusioned with the process that got us here. But more than anything else, we're disappointed that those entrusted with our futures tossed that concern aside with hardly a second thought. Our schools should be something that we, as a community, can be proud of. Pembroke Academy was the 2023 New Hampshire Secondary School of Excellence. After this budget cut, Pembroke's amazing teachers and students are going to struggle to achieve recognition of that sort for the foreseeable future. Speaking of Pembroke's teachers, we should also discuss staffing cuts. I'm not going to get into specifics um, given um, the chair's statements about New Hampshire law, but given the sizable nature of the budget decrease are all but inevitable at this point in time. They're inevitable and they're catastrophic. Letting teachers go has some obvious short-term consequences, such as an increase in class sizes, but it's the long-term effects that are the most concerning. Cutting teachers means cutting classes and potentially even entire programs. I personally am very worried about the potential of cuts to the honors and AP programs. Clubs could also shutter without advisors to guide them. Fewer teachers also means that students could struggle to find the support that they need, and it will certainly lead to a decrease in the overall quality of education provided at Pembroke schools. Even if you were to brush aside all of these concerns, we haven't taken into account the impacts of these cuts on the teachers themselves. My mom is a public school teacher. I understand how hard teachers work for their students and how thankless their job can be at times. It is appalling 
that certain members of this community saw no issue in jeopardizing the livelihoods of the very people who care for their children on a daily basis. Even outside the classroom, these cuts will have an outsized impact on students' lives. I've already mentioned that clubs could potentially fall victim to staffing cuts. Sports may also become pay to play, denying students from lower income households the athletic opportunities afforded to their more fortunate peers. It's these sorts of activities that distinguish high school from middle and elementary school, and it's these sorts of activities that constitute a critically undervalued part of the Pembroke Academy experience. Education is the central mission of every school, yes, but the purpose of high school isn't just education. High school is also supposed to be a place where students can explore new opportunities and come to grips with what they want their future to look like, and extracurricular activities are absolutely essential to that mission. Without those kinds of opportunities, Pembroke Academy would be ill-equipped to compete with our peer schools. I don't want to take up too much of the allotted speaking time tonight, so I'm going to conclude my comments here. I hope that I have been able to provide some insight into the frustrations of the student body, and also to provide the school board with some valuable input. My first year of high school has been an incredibly positive experience for me, and my one wish tonight is that my comments help preserve potentially transformative opportunities for future students at PA. I would once again, I would like to once again thank the school board for this opportunity, and also to thank my audience for their attentiveness and engagement. Thank you all. Have an excellent rest of your evening. Thanks, Campbell. Question first. All right. Uh, my name is Sam Samuel Harrington. Um, I live at four nine six Third Range Road, Pembroke, New Hampshire, um, and I'm a junior here at Pembroke Academy. Just make sure you I want to start first by showing understanding of the position that this board and a lot of people within our community are in. It's not an easy decision. It's people's livelihoods. It's a lot. And me personally, I am a double varsity sport athlete. I'm a student senator. I'm in the drama club here. I'm in band. I'm involved within our community. And I see a lot of different sides of that community. One thing that I wish to communicate to you is not, it's not to tell you this is what we need to cut. This is what needs to go. Because in theory, it's a shame that we have to cut anything at all. What I would like you to keep in mind is that people like me and a lot of the people that are in the audience today have bound a lot of ourselves through these extracurriculars and, and especially music. I came into high school, like the majority of us, very self-conscious and I was very scared and it was hard to make connections through that community. Um, PA's had a shaky history um, over the decades with our music department. Um, but in the recent years, I've seen the light of it, and I've seen the tons of opportunities I've had with that. Again, I wish to stress to you that I've seen growth through myself, I've seen growth through my peers, and I hope that that's something that you keep in your mind when you check that box, or when you think of, do we cut this person or not? It's a hard choice, but I'd like to bring up something Campbell said, where it's, it's hard to compete with other people and other music departments when we're already struggling to push ourselves through that. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. My name is, my name is Samantha Cox. I'm, <laughs> my name is Samantha Cox. I'm a sophomore here at Pembroke Academy that is in the music department. And I'm in both band and chorus, and I'm also in drama club this year. And I know that for not just myself, but many others in the audience today as well, music is a way of expression for a lot of us. And I believe that there's many opportunities here at Pember Academy that let us show our expression and continue to work on it. And I believe that it's very important to not reduce this opportunity of music at Pember Academy. It's just something overall that a lot of people need to just need to express themselves overall. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Alan Source, and I'm a sophomore here at Pembroke Academy. Um, I started here very nervous, very jittery. Um, 
I really don't know how to describe it, but it's like most of the extracurriculars, like music and drama and robotics. All of these things just brought out a light in me, a light in others that I haven't seen before. These things made me a little more of who I am today, especially music. I owe a lot of my friends and a lot of the people that I cherish truly to this day due to all of these programs. So I ask from the bottom of my heart, please just think about all the angles before you cut something. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, it looks like that's it for students, so we'll go ahead and open it up. We've got 15 minutes if there are members of the community that would like to speak. Wait once. Okay. Looks like none, then we shall move on. So, I'm sure, you got documentation and whatnot. First, I have to thank all of these students for coming. I know how incredibly difficult it is to get up in a room like this and speak, and I really appreciate your feedback. And I want you to know that every decision we make, we have you in mind, and we are doing our very best to minimize the impact to all of our students. So thank you for coming. We really appreciate you. Um, so the list that I have for the board, and we'll make sure that we post this um, tomorrow so that everybody can take a look. Um, as Mr. Kamich said, this list does not have anything about staff other than the amount of personnel um, cuts that we'll be making. So this does this document does get us to exactly three million dollars. Um, I need to thank the administration. All of your administrators in this district have spent countless hours working on this and lost a lot of sleep over this. And like I said, we went through this entire budget with students in the forefront of our mind. Um, we tried, there are lots of little cuts, there are some bigger cuts, um, and we just did what we thought was best for our buildings, and that's what we're gonna review with you tonight. And then I know you have the difficult decision of um, making the final uh, cuts on the budget. So the document will be familiar to some of you. We presented some cuts in January to the board when we were trying to decide if we were gonna go into um, meet with the municipal budget committee with some cuts or if we were gonna save them. We ended up making um, $300,000 before we went to the municipal budget committee um, and tried to go in with the same number um, as the MBC, thinking that would show some unity with the community. Unfortunately, uh, that didn't play out the way that we were hoping it would, but those cuts were on the list. So um, just, I know you can't see this list in the audience, but it's things like supplies. And you know, if we wanted $3,000 in English books, maybe we're only getting $1,000 in English books. So things that we feel like we can get by with and will minimize the impact. Um, there's things like new furniture that we plan to get. Um, we were going to get hurdles for $10,000 at PA. Um, we took those out. So anything we feel like we can wait on. Um, some workshop money, some maintenance projects that Mr. Coughlin, um, unfortunately, is going to have to hold off for a year. Um, but they were pretty significant cuts. There was a $25,000 cut um, and then another $45,000 cut. So these, those things add up. And every time we're doing these, we're thinking about what's best for students and how can we save as many staff as possible. So that's what you see on this list. Um, there's, what else can I share with you? Um, some book money, travel and conferences, um, extra money for curriculum development. So typically we would try to uh, allow teachers to come in and uh, do some work on their curriculum in the summer. We may, may not be able to offer as much of that as we have in the past. Um, there are some additional cuts in the area of special education that Unfortunately, I won't be able to discuss in public. I can answer the board's questions um, outside of public session um, in non-public, but I can't speak to specifics about why we were able to make those cuts at this point. 
So you, um, I know that the topic of special education has been a hot topic. Sure. So um, I know you mentioned you would get this posted tomorrow. So for now, can you just go over some of those line items and amounts? Yep. So the new, um, if you didn't see it at the top, the new cuts are highlighted or in grayscale, so they're easier to point out. Um, so in specifically in Pembroke Academy, um, there is an area called placement, and that is uh, cut seventy five thousand. Summer placement is cut ten thousand. Transportation is cut seventy thousand, and then summer transportation is cut fifteen thousand. So there was a pre pretty significant cut at Pembroke Academy. And for those of you who may not have been part of these meetings before, when we're talking about just a few students, we can't get into the details. Those students' privacy rights are. Um, legally protected. So we can't get into the specifics other than to tell you the amounts. Um, we were able to cut some um, of the, we, we're going to hire another position to deliver ESOL services and we're going to make do with what we have. So that's um, a cut. We cut some more field trip money um, at Three Rivers. Again, um, small cuts like social studies supplies, curriculum development, books, um, are the new cuts at Three Rivers. And then at Hill School, um, we cut some additional training stipends, books, um, curriculum development, and then there was a pretty significant cut to special education at the Hill School. There was uh, $100,000 for placements, $20,000 for summer placements, $24,200 for transportation, $5,000 for summer transportation, $2,100 in special ed supplies, $10,000 in behavioral support, and we are cutting um, school psychologist services one day per week, so that was another $22,000. So, um, you know, this is a pretty long list, and like I said, we went through line by line by line. We were still um, nowhere near $3 million with um, the cuts on this sheet, and unfortunately, the other um, it's actually $2,328,734 will be personnel cuts. Um, and I know that's really scary, and I know that we can't talk about that in public, um, but I just feel like it's okay for me to say outside of um, non-public that any chance that we had for staff that were already leaving or positions that may be vacant, we tried our hardest to make those the cuts so that we, did, we could minimize the impact on people that were planning to stay here with us. So we aren't always able to do that, but I just wanted to reassure you that that's what we did first. I just want to add a note um, because some people might be wondering when when Ms. Sherman says um, cuts to special education, if you were involved in the budgeting process at all or even came to the public meetings um, this past couple of weeks, you may have heard um, that special education is federally mandated. We can't make cuts in those areas, but now you're hearing there's cuts. So again, we can't go into details, but I, I guess the way I would say it is keep in mind that the budget that was proposed at the town gets originally started months and months and months ago. And so anything that you're hearing that are cuts in special education right now actually represents actual changes that have occurred since then to now. We're not just saying, oh, we didn't actually need that $75,000 or whatever it is. It has to do with the student population here changing from then to now. Um, so the word cut is kind of ambiguous there, but it's, it's not a choice. So I guess, um, I'm going to just open it up if you have thoughts, but I, I know I need to look a minute to sort of just look at this and soak it in. So mics are open. If you've got questions for um, for Patty, fire away. I'll do the same. I actually have a question for you about if something is now or not public. So. I need to think about how I want to phrase it. I guess what I can say, if I may, um, that isn't specifically, well, it's sort of attached to people, but not specifically. Um, we did not recommend cutting our co-curricular programs. And I'm sure that's one of the first things you were scrolling through to see what our recommendations were, and I just want people to know when this is posted publicly, this is the first draft, this is the first recommendation from administration. It doesn't mean that this is 
the final. The board has the final decision on everything. But like I said, when we were talking about the, the student experience and things that impact the most students, we did not suggest cutting any co-curricular programs. Had, um, I had a question about that, but I, I just want to make a statement first, and it sort of echoes one of the first testimonies that we received tonight, which is um, the board is in an exceptionally hard position. This is a really hard job. Um, only speaking for myself here, not for my um, board mates or the administration, but I do not want to be making the decisions that we have to make. I am, um, it's very unfortunate that our proposed budget was not funded at anywhere close to what the board and the municipal budget committee and the administration felt was needed to fund uh, the Pembroke School District. So with that, you know, again, speaking for myself, when you hear me saying things that I'm in favor of this cut or that cut, I'm not in favor of any of these cuts. I'm just put in the position of having to pick what is the least bad at this point. And so I just really want to emphasize that before we engage in this conversation. Having said all that, um, I was a little bit surprised to see, um, and I think you confirmed it, but let me just ask it. So, when you say co-curriculars, what does that mean in terms of, does that mean sports or does that mean sports plus, you know, all the other stuff? That means everything. All of it. Okay. And um, I guess my instinct would be it seems a little imbalanced to cut from supplies of things that are sort of core educational, you know, books, for example, curriculum development line items, and not cut any co-curriculars. Can you summarize a little bit about the deliberations that administration went through on that? I will also at some point defer to um, the building leaders, but we we looked at everything that we offer and we sat and thought, okay, should we look at things that don't have the highest participation rate? Should we look at the things that cost the most? Um, and I don't, we could not come to a way to say there's only 10 kids that take part in this and there's 20 kids that take part in this, so the one with 10 kids should go. We could not sit there and say, this is more important than that. Like every kid has a place and there's something for everyone. And that's something that we're so proud of. And it keeps kids safe after school and it gives them a place to be with their friends that's safe and supervised. And um, there's lots of research that shows that co-curricular activities, no matter what they are, are keeping kids out of trouble. They're, it's a diversion um, to other things that they may be getting into. And we just find them to be so important um, that we did not include them. I'll, I'll let Dr. Morrison, Mr. McCarthy specifically. So to me, uh, there is a philosophical reason and a practical reason for why we didn't include co-curriculars. And by co-curriculars, we're talking about interscholastic sports, student government, uh, robotics, things that help provide a well-rounded education and help us with our mission of educating the whole child. So philosophically, one of our school goals at Pembroke Academy is to be a Spartan. And what that really means to me is an invitation to engage in our community, engage in the opportunities that we have and uh, which opportunities identify best with your interests. Um, and then through your participation, enhance our community. and that to me is incredibly important and a huge part of the student experience here at Pembroke Academy. As you know, only one of our towns provides busing uh, and that 
comes with it a host of inherent challenges, but one of the ways that we've combated that over the years is by having a robust co-curricular program that allows students to do things after school. Uh, and to me, you get an outsized benefit uh, throughout the school community, throughout the student experience, compared to the amount of money that you invest in. And so there's a tremendous amount of value that um, goes into that, uh, that to me it's very easy to make an argument for why we should be keeping that. Now from a practical perspective, if we were to, um, we were to identify particular programs to not fund, I think that has uh, an unintended consequence with it in terms of our enrollment. And what that would mean is that, you know, as I said, like, it's our school goal, like, engage in our community. If we're taking away those opportunities, and some of these, like, for instance, let's just say, you know, basketball, for instance, there are families that have invested thousands of dollars into their children uh, in basketball, and that's something that, you know, is a core part of their identity. If we were to get rid of that, there's no judgment on my part that, you know, if a family decides that they need to go find that opportunity somewhere else. And so what happens with that is we're actually losing the students that are our student leaders, are our you know, student mentors, are our examples for the rest of the student body of how to engage and how to represent our school in the most constructive and positive way. And so it just, to me, from a practical and philosophical perspective, it was very difficult to advocate for a cut in any of those. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to say here is going to echo Dr. Morris because we've had some really heart to heart talks about this. And we are of the same philosophy that the formative years in middle school is where we want to build, grow them into the young men and women that will go to Pembroke Academy, will be a Spartan. If, if we were to remove a program, a co curricular, a sport, we are reducing that opportunity for students to have the full experience of what school should be. And this cut is it truly unfortunate in what we're all trying to do is preserve the student experience the best we can given the situation we have. And Dr. Morris is correct. Sports, extracurriculars, they bring kids to school. It keeps kids academically engaged because there are requirements to play that sport, to participate in that activity. And if sometimes those kids don't have those carrots, they lose out on the learning opportunities in the class. And we just we agree very much. So I'm not going to echo everything he says because we, there's a lot to talk about tonight. But I feel it was not in the best interest of the students. Okay. Uh, Amy, that was your question, so I want to give you a chance. I've got thoughts on that too, but if you have more, go ahead. That answers my question for now. I'm good. Thank you. Um, so I, I just want to dig in there a little bit more on that topic, um, but I feel like I have to echo Amy's disclaimer too. Um, I don't, I don't want to cut anything. I want everybody to have every opportunity they can possibly have, and that's part of the reason why this board went ahead and presented the budget to the town the way that it was. If we thought that there was stuff that was not important, um, we would have taken out of the budget before. So, I mean, that was a unanimous budget on our part, so you can rest assured as Amy said, we all hate this position and I don't want to cut anything on here. So if you hear me advocate for certain cuts, um, it's not because I want to make them, um, it's because we have to make some. So on the topic of co-curriculars, I have a few comments. Um, one is uh, the idea that we may lose uh, revenue or just students, um, I think is entirely valid. Um, what I would push back a little bit on is I think that there are probably also families that if to save those co-curriculars, we need to lose more staff and we hurt the academic integrity of the building, um, I think we can certainly lose students on that end too. I think there are kids that have sought out Pembroke because um, of the academic rigor that we have. And I could certainly see some families making the choice to send their children elsewhere if they didn't think that we were delivering that value anymore. Um, so that's just food for thought. Um, I guess what I would ask, oh, I guess one more comment is just that um, if 
we did go down that road. Um, I think, too, it would be very hard to say this and not that. Um, specifically, sports versus non-sports. I think I would personally have a very hard time saying, you know, we're going to get rid of, and, and these are just things I'm making up, but if we were proposing to get rid of, like, the crochet club or something like that, um, but keeping soccer, I'd have a really hard time with that because, um, you know, to some extent, I feel like sports kids actually have options. There's club teams, there's community teams, where a kid that's staying after for crochet or homework club or something like that um, can't go get that somewhere else necessarily. So that, I think, makes the decision even more difficult because it kind of makes it an all or nothing, right? Like, like Mr. Sherman said, to say, well, this, this co-curricular or extracurricular is important and this one's not, um, seems a little impossible. But what I would ask, because I, I, don't, I think that very few of any final decisions are going to be made here tonight, um, for the sake of due diligence, what I would ask is if you, um, if you guys could take a look at what the, that total price tag is for extracurriculars and then bump that up against the list that we have here, including personnel. And let's, let's say that, that, that the number for co-curriculars equals $500,000. Where, where would you allocate that $500,000 if we were to get rid of those, those extracurriculars, co-curriculars? And again, I'm not saying I want to do that, um, but I think for, for me to make the best decision that I can when it comes to that time, I would like to see where that money would be prioritized if it was not going to sports and clubs. I would like to see that as well. Thank you, Andy. Okay, we'll have that for, the next, for probably next week. So, Patty, I just have a question for you. Um, I noticed in the cuts that you've got transportation listed. Are those the bus route adjustments within two miles of the schools? No, the only transportation we have um, is for specialized transportation. Those are the only cuts. Okay, so um, those have not. The we, we did look at, um, I did consult with the business administrator, and we do contract. Our contract is for a specific number of buses. So if we were going to pursue that, it would be a contractual conversation and negotiation. And, and is it a, we've signed a contract for how many years at this point? We just signed a new one for three. We go to, I was going to say, I think we, because we had five and I think we went down to three. Do we have any clause in there that says that we can reevaluate at the end of each year? I don't believe so. I think, I think Amber would have mentioned it, but I, I did ask her to look into it, but I can just make sure of it. Yeah, there's you don't want because I think Not the, the busing is one of the things that we're we should try and adjust. Yep. And if the board, you know, if if all of you feel strongly about that, it doesn't mean that we can't have the conversation and try to negotiate something. Um, but as of right now, we do negotiate for a specific number. I. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry. Go ahead, Gina. Um. I I I would like to. Every time we go out to bid for public or for school transportation, um, we get one uh, proposal. So, uh, based on that, uh, I I don't know what the implications are, but I think we do have to go up after this contract with them, given that it's it's always one sided every year. So we have to renegotiate to to our benefit at this. Point. Uh, the other question I had, oh, sorry. Jane, can, just before we leave yeah. buses, um, I wanted to encourage us to be hard negotiators, even if there is not an express term in the contract that says, you know, in these circumstances, we have the right to renegotiate. That doesn't mean we can't ask to renegotiate, you know, and so I really want us to be pushing that. I did just want to preview, though, I do have some concerns with um, no longer offering busing for all students within the two-mile radius, um, primarily those little, little, little kindergarten legs, the first grade legs, you know, uphill, barefoot, in the snow kind of conditions. Um, it really, to, to my non-educator knowledge, and we should probably hear from Wendy, but it can really impact attendance, and I think there's a lot to process there, and it may not be the biggest bang for our buck. But. Yeah, I'm a, little, I'm a little bit torn on it, too, but 
like with the sports, I'd like to see, you know, all the possibilities laid out. But I do think if, you know, if the roles were reversed building wise and we were still at village school, I, I think I'd be more, but Hill School is so sort of out in the middle of nowhere that you can be two miles from that school and you live, you know, on cross country road or something and that's not really walkable. But again, I, I would like to see the option for sure. I'd like to see the dollar amount. It may be the unfavorable opinion, but we don't have to provide it if it's with less than two miles, K through eight. And I'd like to see what the savings may be because I would rather save teachers than we've just always provided transportation, is my thing. Um, and and I, I've said this before, we were put in this position uh, two Saturdays ago, and we have to deal with it, a decision that others made for us, and everything's on the table. So by law, we have to provide busing outside of two miles. So this is something that we need to pursue. Uh, and I, you know, it, it will put a great strain on, on families, but this is where we are right now. Other thoughts on that or any other thing that we got in front of us here? I just want, I'd like to know why we can cut, uh, I believe it was three, 25,000 for ESOL, which is English speakers of other languages from each school um, at this point. So I spoke to Assistant Superintendent Bickford about our budget predicament, and um, we have not been able to fill the position. We've had it posted. We've desperately tried. Um, we've had some student movement around the SAU. Uh, and she feels that given the current conditions that we will figure out a way to make it work without filling that position. It's a, it was an SAU-wide position. Uh, and, you know, right now it's absolutely burdening the, the, the couple of staff that we have. And if STEM, some students, there's student movement, then we could be um, having to contract that service out. But for right now, given, like I said, given the circumstances, we're comfortable cutting it. Thank you. Patty, I just want to ask a question about these cuts that we are making to special ed. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we are we getting ourselves up against potential litigation because of these cuts that we're making? No. Okay. Um, has the administration, um, does the administration have any opinion as to um, whether we should fund any of these cuts from dipping into our trust funds? We had that conversation. Um, right now, I think all of our efforts have just gone into figuring out how to get to $3 million. Uh, but we did talk about, uh, you know, I want you to hear the whole package. So we kind of need to hear the rest of the conversation about um, staffing patterns. But we did talk about, OK, if we, you know, if we get through this year, we're already in trouble this year. You know, if we get through this year with a positive balance and we don't have to touch any of our trust funds, then next year could we chip off, you know, $20,000 of these you know, and get Mr. McCarthy some new atlases as we were talking about today. That's <laughs> the level that we're at. Um, but we did talk about using the trust funds for that. Yeah. And, and I think that's an important point too. I, you know, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to make these hard decisions about cuts, but I don't think our job is done then. I think that we all individually, and then we need to come together, sort of backwards prioritize this stuff as to, hey, if we find some money or if we can, if we decide to dip into trust funds, where's that going to go first? I'm looking over this list and I know you can't all see it. You'll see it tomorrow um, outside of some, some special ed stuff. There's very few things here that are over $2,000. Um, you know, one that sticks out to me that I feel strongly about that this board has talked about a lot over the past three or four years is $11,000 of TRS for field trip expenses. Um, I know it's been, it's been the feeling of this board that the sixth grade environmental uh, camp trip and the eighth grade Washington DC trip are, are core parts of the curriculum. They're not, they're, you know, I'm sure they're fun for students, um, but, you know, sending all of our eighth graders to our nation's capital is something that we believe strongly in, um, but, you know, and that's, that's 11,000. 
I'm not sure if there's anything else on here over two or three grand that's not a that's not a, um, a 1200 line. So that's the thing is like, even if we start putting stuff back, it's, it's, it's going to be a lot. To, I guess the hurdles at 10K is, is another big one. And to me, that's a no brainer, I guess. And um, can I just, I want to recognize, you know, um, democracy in action, public participation. I heard it. I'm sure I wasn't alone. There was um, a repeated sentiment from voters that, you know, there should be fundraising going on at the schools. There is fundraising going on at the schools. There's fundraising that is going on for the eighth grade trip, for the sixth grade trip, and for a bazillion other things. And people who have students in the schools should know this because, you know, I feel sometimes as a parent, there isn't a month that goes by that I'm not writing a check to one of the schools. You know, ten dollars here, fifteen dollars here, ten dollars there. It's it's constant. Um, but I really echo, and we have talked about this a lot. These these two field trips are core educational experiences, and when you put it all on fundraising, it it really risks again, as one of our speakers mentioned tonight, putting it into that pay to play situation where it is out of reach of many of our families. And even one might argue, well, it's fundraising. How can, be it, how can it be out of reach? But fundraising requires, you know, parental or guardian involvement, encouragement, overseeing, time and investment. And not all of our students' families have that capacity. So I just want to recognize the, um, you know, we heard the voters and the desire for fundraising. There is fundraising. I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's still going to be there. Um, so that is definitely happening. I, to piggyback on that a little bit, I would, I, and I don't want to be misconstrued as um, agreeing that all of our problems can be solved with fundraising, certainly. But I do know, um, I'm not sure if it's as big of a thing here in New Hampshire. I know it was in New York. I know it is in Massachusetts still. Um, I know that PALS does a ton um, for the younger students, but I do think, regardless of how this shakes out, I don't think that this is a short-term solution that can help us in the next budget year. But I do, I do recommend that um, Pembroke Academy look at establishing a full-on booster club so that we can support those extracurriculars with as much non-taxpayer money, if you want to, however you want to word that, as we can. I know that some individual sports fundraise, um, you know, I know the baseball players usually sell Spartan cards, and but it, it seems a little bit disjointed. And I would just encourage that I, I think it, it could be um, done as a more unified and efficient thing that might have better results. Um, so that's something that I would, you know, we can talk about more after this, but that's something that I would encourage that we that we look into. Um, it, I guess I'll keep it rolling. I've got a couple. So these are these are twelve hundred lines, Patty. So if you can't go into it, I get it. But um, the very last two on the sheet, they're both Pembroke Hill School um, yep. behavioral support and school psychology one day per week. Yep. I'm wondering if you can give me a picture of what that is. I know you know not talking about students, a particular student, but um, you know behavioral support ten thousand dollars is that. Also, one last day a week, what do those people actually do day to day? So that is another um, SAUY contracted service. Um, and that would be the support from a BCBA. So that would be, you know, the SAU hires the employees and then Pembroke gets some of their time to come into the schools and give support in the areas of um, behavioral issues. So that is a portion of that that we would not use. Okay. So, and so I'm assuming that that would be used in some of the more extreme behavioral scenarios. Yep. So that's and then the um, we we have a school psychologist um, delivering services and doing testing at Hill School. Uh, we're just cutting one day a week, and we're going to make the schedule work. You know. Great. Anybody else have initial thoughts? I know this is going to take a little while to. So good. And again, in case you, 
you didn't hear it when Patty said it before, we have seen some of this before. We, every year we sort of put together a worst case scenario contingency thing. Turns out our worst case scenario wasn't even close to worst case scenario. Um, but many of these lines we've, we've seen before. So that's why there's not a ton of discussion here. I, I guess I'll call out, there is one other uh, big line uh, it's almost twenty-five thousand dollars, twenty-four nine ninety-nine. I'm assuming it's that way so that we can keep that budget line open by yes. leaving a dollar in it um, for maintenance projects. And I, I just want to say it publicly because I've said it before: um, delaying maintenance projects is why we were in the predicament that we were in with Village School. Um, and these are the types of things that these budget cuts do. If we're, I mean, this is one school; it's just TRS, twenty-five thousand dollars worth of maintenance um, that's not going to get done, along with. As Patty said, we're running pretty close to, um, you know, making it through this year without having to ask for additional appropriations, which means there's most likely going to be very little, if any, surplus, which means the Warren articles that were passed last March um, that, you know, uh, they all say from surplus funds on June 30th or, or July 1st, whatever it is, none of those are going to get funded, or many of those are deposits to um, trust funds specifically for these maintenance projects. So, again, I mean, everybody here probably understands this, but we can't let another building get in disrepair. Um, you know, we haven't even got to the discussion about what these cuts may or may not mean for the future of, of a building project at Hill. That's a whole other conversation. Um, but I gotta imagine that timeline is either gonna be delayed or the, the scope of that project is gonna be reduced by a lot. So we need to take, take care of the buildings that we have. Um, so when I see $25,000 cut from maintenance, that's scary. Um, I, I think I voiced my opinion on this subject prior to this meeting, but I agree wholeheartedly wholeheartedly with you, Andy, on this, but the fact remains we are now in this position. Um, we've all spent hundreds of hours this year going through the budget process, all our regular meetings. I'm not opposed to calling special meetings to get money to fix the roof, to fix a window. I get extra time now, and um, <laughs> but, you know, that's the reality. If it comes to spending out our trust funds to minimize the impact on the staff in this school i'm more than willing to do it and you know if if a roof you know 100 grand we need 100 grand for a roof and we don't have it in the trust fund well we've got to fix that roof so we've got to call a special meeting to raise and appropriate a hundred thousand dollars i have no problem with it right now None whatsoever. um so i Echo your sentiment, but uh, you know, I mean, everything's on the table. Yeah. And I guess to clarify that a little bit, um, because the trust funds have been thrown around a little bit here tonight. Uh, so I just want to explain a little bit for the public an option that's available to us. And I'm not endorsing or not endorsing this, but so we have certain trust funds that have very specific use cases. We put money into those through those Warren articles that I told you about before. Um, if we have surplus money at the end of the year. So there's a balance in those, and some of them are fairly small. Some are really, really big, um, depending on what their intended use is. Um, we can't spend most of those. We can't spend that money on just anything, and in many cases, we can't spend it without coming to the voters and asking if we can spend it. Um, however, what we do have the ability to do is also call a special meeting with the community to dissolve those trust funds. And if we were to dissolve a trust fund that had $200,000 in it, that money gets absorbed into the budget for that year. Um, to me, you know, we might have to, um, but I know from being, um, working with the NBC for the past four or five years, that at least in their eyes, that would really not be the right thing to do. We have established those funds to sort of try to keep the huge, you know, hills and dips out of the tax rate, because then when a vehicle goes and we need to buy a new truck, the money's in the bank and we go and buy it instead of adding another $30,000 into the into the budget for that year. Um, so you know, it's sort of a nuclear option, but I just wanted to explain what we're talking about here. It, it is an option um, and we're kind of at the all options are on the table stage of this thing. Um, 
All right, is there anything else? All right, not seeing any, I wanna ask the board. Um, so we have a non-public session, as we said, um, to discuss this further for sensitive things that by law can't be discussed in public. And then after that, we would have non-public, or I'm sorry, we would have public comment again. Um, I'm inclined, since we have thrown a lot of stuff around here, to move that public comment section up to now, since I think non-public could be pretty long and I don't expect people to hang out in the hallway for an hour, hour and a half. Are we all okay with that? Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. So I'll go ahead and, and we'll switch around to agenda item number six. We'll put it right now. Um, so we'll open up the mic one more time. If anybody has anything, you know, after hearing that, um, I'll say, if you're even thinking about it, jump up there. It's not as scary as it seems, but we work for you. We were voted in by you. We want to hear your opinion. So if you've heard us say anything tonight that you're just like, no, you guys are idiots, tell us that. Um, if you have an idea that we haven't thought of now or in the coming weeks, certainly email me, email Ms. Sherman. Um, we are open to any advice that we can get on this because it's a terrible situation. And we certainly don't claim to be the five smartest people in Pembroke when it comes to this. So please share your thoughts, share your feelings, email, phone calls, whatever. One of the, thing, one of the things that we didn't mention tonight and you know, some of the students, some of the other people were at the meetings. Uh, rarely see students at any of our meetings, but we had a $3 million increase to our budget this year. The actual operating budget, I think, only grew by $179,000 um, in that range. Everything else came either through special education, transportation, or uh, teacher contracts. That was the bulk of that three million dollar increase that the residents saw on our on our uh, in our budget. Uh, the reason those increases were so extreme were because of what we have to offer. Um, you know, we, we every three, I think it's four years now, we negotiate with the teachers in each one of the schools for a new contract um, that's done you know by us here goes out to the teachers then it gets approved by you by us and the teachers union um, aside from that everything else is out of our hands as you heard me mention before the transportation side of this we put it out for bid at the end of every contract that we have we only ever get one bus company to respond to that bid so there is no competition and we are held to using that company. Whatever, if they wanted to say your, your uh, busing is gonna cost 1.2, 1.5 million extra for the next year, that's what we get. Otherwise, there's no busing and we have to provide it for anybody outside of two, two miles. Uh, as for special education, those also are required services by, by the federal government and the state. Um, that money, that we raise to fund these programs is not getting offset by the government at all. They were supposed to spend or pay 40% of the special ed budgets of the schools. I don't believe they spent, you know, maybe 10% at any given time, maybe a little bit more, that's it. So it's all on our backs. So one of the things I'm asking everybody, especially the students here, all right, Right, you, you may not be able to vote, you may not be 18 yet, but you can still write a letter to your representatives, whether it's our senators and representatives that go to Washington or our representatives and senators that are in Concord. You can write the letters and demand that they fund education adequately. Because what happened today is a direct result, or two Saturdays ago, is a direct result of the failings of the government, both at the state level and at the federal level. So that's it. Oh, and I, all, all you guys, I expect to see you next year in this process, all right? On Saturday, when we go out in front of the town, you're there supporting your schools too. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. There, there are bills in the state house that are trying to expand voucher programs so that the tax dollars go to non-public schools. Um, and there are court cases that have already been won um, that say that New Hampshire is not providing enough money to the schools for an adequate education and they still 
um, refused to provide that. So, uh, yeah, definitely talk to your representatives. Yes, sir. Hi, um, Ken Nivison, 661 Cross Country Road. I want to follow up on that question because I have sort of a radical thought here. Um, you mentioned that there are court cases. Um, to what extent could you sue the state and federal government? I know the question has come up, and we've we've asked before, um, and I think there are people are. Right? There's a, there's there was a class action suit. I think that we were actually asked in the the last one where the state was found guilty or liable, whatever it was. Um, we were approached and asked if we wanted to join that, and I think we didn't we didn't join it fully. There's a, a separate category called like an interested party or something. Um, so we were attached to that case in a way, um, but I mean, they've been sued, they've lost twice. Um, you know, we could do it. I think that it would be a, it would be uh, sort of ceremonial, if you will, and b, it would definitely cost us money, um, which the community is certainly not behind right now. So, um, but I mean, I'm certainly open to the option if it were feasible. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, because it, I assume that you built the budget planning for them not to fulfill their obligations. Yes. I just wonder what happens if you don't do that. Right. Yeah, I see what you're saying. You see what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah. 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 That's all. Thanks. Thanks. Anybody else? I will address that slightly. Um, we had a, a, a brief discussion, uh, not necessarily in jest, but kind of put something out there of actually creating a bill and sending that bill to Concord for unpaid uh, adequacy and also to um, the Department of Education in Washington for unfunded uh, mandates that come around. Uh, we may go to try that. Who knows? Go ahead. Kristen Doyle, Center Road. Uh, I'm going to apologize first and foremost that I'm standing here in front of my boss in ripped jeans. I was not planning to speak. Um, I'm also, I tend to be a very good public speaker if I'm prepared and I'm not, so I'm speaking off the cuff. Um, and I apologize if I get emotional. I'm usually here speaking as a parent, but I'm here speaking as a employee of the Pembroke School District. And we are terrified of what is going on in our community and what that means for all of us. And I've heard things proposed this evening and all that I can ask of you on behalf of my colleagues is to make the decision as quickly as you can so that we can plan for next year. I don't want you to rush through anything, but looking at the terror in the eyes of my colleagues and people in other buildings that I've spoken with is really hard. And we're still coming to school every day and we're teaching your children and we're smiling and we're doing the best we can, but it's, it's wearing us down. So the sooner that we can be there to support each other and your students would be in everyone's best interest. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Olivia Dean. Um, so people on Facebook are already going, as they typically do. So Andy, I just have a question for you, more clarifying something. Were you saying that you would rather cut the TRS soccer club than a crochet club? No. OK. Um, <laughs> no. Um, I'll clarify that one more time for the millions watching at home, I suppose. I was simply trying to say that trying to choose between soccer and crochet club would be a difficult thing to do because even though something like crochet club may be uh, less utilized, I'm sure that there are probably more soccer players than there are crochet club members. Um, that doesn't mean it's any less important to that kid. And whether or not it's because, you know, they have a tough home life and they'd rather stay in the building or they've just made new friends for the first time in crochet club, um, crochet club can 100% be just as important as playing soccer or playing football for the right kid. Thank you, Andy. Hello, all. Some of you may know me. Never seen you before. Some of you may actually admit to knowing me. Let's put it that way. 
Glenn Hansen, I live on Broadway. I was a member of your August group for 24 years, including 22 years as its chair. That was what I consider a temporary insanity period of my life. In this situation, this happens every five years to some degree or another based upon revaluation of the properties. This is the worst it's been. In my term on the school board, we had three or four times what well, we had about a million dollars or a million and a half. Patty was part of that probably as assistant superintendent back then. But I want you to understand that I try to be a little bit more uh, aggressive because this is my 10th year on the budget committee. Yes, I am a glutton for punishment. On the budget committee, I propose that we actually project what the total assessed value of the town would be. And Gene would know that I think, I think I lost that vote. I was one and there were 10 opposed. So I wasn't able to essentially convince people that that would be a better way to express what in, was in fact causing the property tax increase. By doing it the way we did, which is just to leave the property tax evaluation alone, we said it was going to go up 28.8%. The irony is that if they had put in the amount of what I expected the increase to be gross, and what have a talk to the town administrator thought would be the end, up, end point for that, assessed valuation, the tax rate would have went up 25 cents per thousand. So consequently, we would have seen that the real reason that property taxes went up or are projected to go up is because of the revaluation, not because of your budget. The $3 million number was a number somebody picked out of thin air and put it before you. Now, in the times that I had to deal with this, as what Andy is doing as chair, we had some tough times, we made some decisions, and I don't envy you what you're going to be dealing with. But the point is, each of those times, we did not, because we're talking about much smaller numbers, we did not deal with anything which as far as cuts were concerned, with Pembroke Academy. I encourage you, do not spare Pembroke Academy. Not because I'm opposed to Pembroke Academy, all of my children graduated from there, but because we have a unique opportunity at PA. We're essentially creating a situation where we're requiring more credits than is required essentially by the state. If you cut the number of credits and you also increase the average class size there, you will save some people, basically, in KA. If you leave Pembroke Academy alone, as we did, the number of cuts that went to personnel all came out of KA. Grossly unfair. And I really believe that you would be better off taking some of the flexibility that you have at PA and dealing with it. By, even if it's three or four slots, that's three or four that aren't going to come out of K-8. That's the one thing I think you should do. The other thing that you have to be aware of is that the AREA agreement does not allow a sending district to not pay you, so your revenue is not going to go down. If they have a student that lives in their community, they're required to pay you whether they send them to PA or not. So the argument that was always passed along to us when we were dealing with this was that the revenue would go down. It's not. So please be aware that if you make the cuts 
proportional across K-12, at least you will get some support from those people who are very concerned about the K-8 cuts that potentially could take the brunt of these cuts. So please focus on that. I don't envy you, and this is my way of apologizing to you for failing to get the budget committee to understand that what we were doing was giving the voters misinformation. Thanks, Clint. Um, I think that's a really good point that I'd sort of like to clarify. I say sort of because it, it still kind of bakes my noodle a little bit to think about it, but you've heard the argument, if you've been involved in any of this, that if you cut a dollar at Pembroke Academy, you're only really saving um, 40 cents because of the revenue side. But as Clint pointed out, the revenue side's not gonna decrease um, unless we did something that made it so kids couldn't come here. So what we have to do is lower our appropriations number, the amount of money that we're asking for by $3 million. And the revenue side is not gonna be impacted. Um, so I think in a way, and what Mr. Hansen was just getting at is that whole 40 cents on the dollar thing is sort of um, misunderstood, I think. All right, um, I don't see anybody else seeing up. We'll give it one last call if there's anybody that wants to contribute. Okay, then we'll, clo we'll close public comment. And the board has need to go into non-public session under New Hampshire RSA 91-A colon three, Roman numeral two, small letters A and C. Small letter A is the dismissal, promotion, compensation, or disciplining of an employee or an investigation of any charges against him or her. And small letter C is matters which if discussed in public would likely affect adversely the reputation of any person other than a member of the board. A roll call vote to go into non-public session at 9.15 p.m. Melanie. Yes. Carrie. Yes. Jean. Amy. Yes. And MES. So we'll